Welcome to Southwest Utah Health Update. With almost 300,000 living in the region, public health is the ounce of prevention that's worth a pound of cure. And now your host for Southwest Utah Health Update, Dave Heaton. Today as a guest, we have Clint Fry. Clint is employed in our environmental health division. You're an environmental health scientist, but what's your other title in the health department? I am the program manager. Programs that I manage are mostly water-based, swimming pools, and wastewater primarily. It's interesting talking about water when we live in an arid region, especially here in Washington County or Kane County. There's a lot of desert where water isn't typically abundant. And so what would you say to people who say, well, you know, why do we have to regulate water as far as pools and drinking water and septic? You want to regulate water because that is what keeps us alive. It, and clean water is a pretty recent occurrence. I mean, if you go back even the late 1800s, clean water was still rare. The technology we have now to keep our water clean and keep bacteria out of our systems keeps us from having things like dysentery or uh, cholera or other diseases. And then as far as the wastewater side of it goes, that is, you know, that protects our groundwater sources that provide us with clean water by having a decent wastewater program. As far as swimming pools goes, those are kind of historically, if you go back far enough, it's they're probably most closely related to the communal baths in Roman times. And so you don't really want to be sharing all those germs. So we try to keep the water as clean as possible. Uh, Sometimes I've heard environmental health scientists say, you know, public swimming pools are really like you're taking a bath with 80 people. (laughs) The the CDC actually put out a poster a few years back that said, uh, in trying to get people to keep pool water out of their mouths, they said, you wouldn't drink your bath water, don't drink the pool water. Right. (laughs) So you've covered... The cycle of water use in our area or anywhere is front end, clean drinking water, and then sanitary on the other end with wastewater, and then recreational use of water. And so, again, down in a warm region like this, I imagine swimming pools are pretty popular. What can you tell us about the distribution of swimming pools per capita in this part of Utah compared to, with the rest of the state? Per capita, we actually are number two. You'd think we'd be the highest, but there are a lot of small spas up in Summit County with all the tourism that they have. And so, their overall population is smaller than ours. So when you do the per capita math, they actually come out ahead of us per capita. Uh, And then total number of swimming pools were second to Salt Lake County because they have such a larger population than us. But if you look at concentration of swimming pools, specifically Washington County is very high compared to the rest of the state. We have district-wide, we have approximately 850 bodies of water. That's a pool or a spa or a splash pad that are either currently operating or in the construction stages. And about 600 of those 850 are in Washington County. Okay. And and uh, those include private pools, like, say, at a home? They do not. Okay. That is only pools that Utah classifies as a public pool. A public pool by Utah Code is a pool that charges for access or has four or more living units having access to it. So that includes all of our HOAs, the hotel, motel pools, in addition to the municipal pools. When we talk about public pools, most people think, oh, well, they're talking about the city pool. Right. Well, it's a much bigger program than that. Okay. So in Washington County alone, I guess that's blowing my mind a little bit, 600 public pools, meaning used by four families or more, or charged to get into, that's not even including people's own private pools, jacuzzis, and spas. Uh, no, it, it doesn't even come close. I, at one point, had reason to talk to just St. George City about their private pools. There was a push to possibly regulate the, the those that teach swimming lessons in their backyard pools, and the state wanted a number of how many, you know, what would that do to your workload? So I reached out to St. George City, and this was back in 2012, so it's gone up since right. that. They looked in their database, and they had over... 1,200 references to the word pool for residential builds. And that's just St. George City. doesn't include Washington, Ivins, wow. Santa Clara, any of that. And that's 10 years ago yeah. before we've seen our growth explosion. And, yeah. and Now, some of that might have been pool fence instead, sure, of, yeah. instead of an actual new pool, but it just gives you a ballpark number of what you'd be dealing with. And 
when we told the state that, thankfully, they said, okay, we're not going to start <laughs> regulating backyard pools. Regulation has a purpose and a place for public health and safety, but would you agree that you can over-regulate? Oh, absolutely. Okay. It's very easy. People talk to environmental health scientists and they get that confused sometimes with environmentalists. We don't, we're not concerned with the same things an environmentalist is. As an environmental health scientist, we're looking at the overall health of the human environment. If it's going to affect a large number of people, then we want to be involved. That's why we try to protect groundwater, why we try to protect swimming pools that are a lot of people are going to be using. Whereas, you know, we'll get called, you know, I've had a call on a swimming pool about somebody saying, complaining that their neighbor's backyard pool is green. And they're concerned about mosquitoes and stuff, and that is a potential hazard. But right. we have a mosquito abatement district to deal with that, and I'm not going to go into somebody's backyard and tell them they need to keep their pool clean because it really only affects, health-wise, that family. So if it affects the public, we're population-based in public health. That's how we approach our interventions and, and education. There are other agencies or even private groups that handle the balance of how we all live together in a healthy way. The, the bigger a community are, sometimes there needs to be more regulation and and uh, most of the time it feels like at least in our district that it's common sense regulation under our board of health and our health department feels like we try to strike the balance of what's the minimum we can do to keep things safe and again first world country public health standards but not get overly bureaucratic or iron fisted usually when we are being bureaucratic or iron fisted it's because we've been mandated to do it by the state okay. because they've got some program that they think needs to be micromanaged whereas we would just as soon say you know we're not going to touch this because people know what they're getting into but sometimes there are situations where the state says, oh, no, you will have a regulation for this and you will enforce it. There's uh, the state law, uh, the statute that covers most of those things is 26A, I believe, okay. is what Title 26A. And it gives the things that a local health department has to cover. And then I do not remember the subsection right. of 26A, but that's what mostly pertains to environmental health. So we're locally based. We're an organization that also, according to law must help regulate the law. And then we have sometimes local policies or regulations. All counties can be a little different, right, sometimes on those? There's a big push at the state level to try and keep us all on approximately the same page so that you don't have a, for our pool builders, that you don't want them coming down here and being able to build some crazy contraption that might actually hurt somebody mm -hmm. and then go up to Utah County or Salt Lake County and be told, no, they can't. And then they go, well, but wait, St. George let me do this. And so we do try to keep on the same page. Okay. And we rely heavily on the state administrative rules. There are other counties that pass their own versions of those administrative rules. We, to date, have just adopted the state ones. So we adopt the state. We consider that a pretty good balance. It's unlikely that our district really is in the mood much for making stricter unless there's a situation that comes up for protection, right? As yeah, the there's, there's very few situations where we have our own regulation. We do have our own non-public drinking water rule because there is not a state level one. So non-public drinking water is drinking water connections fewer than eight connections. Once you have eight connections, then you kick over into being a public water system and the Division of Environmental Quality at the state level takes care of that. But we wanted to have some standard down here and a lot of it went into place before I started with the department, but it has been rewritten a couple of times that allows for us to have a way for places to have a decent standard to protect their drinking water sources. And then if their subdivision grows to the point where they kick over to the state level, they don't have to put as much effort and money into coming up to that public drinking water s system standard if they've done it up front with us. So any any community or development that has over eight what residences connected to a water system, they then come under state oversight. Uh, anything less than that, we have our own regulations to help make sure that they're safe and doing things to where, say, they did grow, then it wouldn't be a big deal to, uh, once they're under state oversight, they're like, oh, we've got to do all these upgrades. We already have helped them be at a safe, uh, acceptable yeah. level. Yeah, one thing that's happened, uh, when I started that uh, state threshold used to be 14 connections, and I do not remember exactly when it lowered, 
but I do know of some of the smaller communities that had, they had 10, you know, 13 connections to stay under that state threshold. The state lowered the threshold. And all of a sudden, they've got to come up with thousands of dollars for a new tank to meet the state standards that they didn't build to the first time. Well grouting so that they're protecting the well to a deep enough depth before stuff gets in. Things like that come into play. When it comes to drinking water and drinking water systems, whether they're small local ones or bigger ones under state oversight or city water supplies, really our goal of us and all of our partner agencies is to make sure that the water you're drinking doesn't make you sick. So what's you've got to have to live is water. We don't want that to somehow be an infectious uh, vector, right? And so what are the main uh, infectious things that we screen for that we, we try to test our water for to make sure it's clean? So all public water systems have, the EPA publishes a testing schedule that they have to test for things. They test for heavy metals, uh, volatile organic compounds. They test every single month for coliform bacteria. Coliform is a what they classify as an indicator bacteria. It's very weak to very mild disinfectants. And if it's showing up in your water system, then you've got some sort of a contamination point that's using up all of your disinfectant. Or in the case of some small systems, they may not even have a disinfectant system. They just might be relying on having clean groundwater coming right. in. And a lot of them do have, but if they've got a crack in a pipe somewhere that's letting soil seep into that, then they can get a positive coliform. They need, they know they need to go clean that pipe, flush it out and replace it. Is that the standard test to test for coliforms then? That's what uh, yeah, you're so, initially looking for in water. So a coliform bacteria, if there's a positive coliform, this is a state rule. It's not something we enforce, but we do have a public water lab that provides this test to many of our water systems. They do one coliform test per it's population based, and I'm not sure what the cutoffs are. I know that like Cedar City brings our lab 30 samples a month, whereas uh, I do not know what St. George does because they do have their own lab. But the central water system brings us one sample a month, so okay. it, 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 it's based on population. But they have one sample, and they have a sample sighting map. They pull a sample from, and they rotate where they're pulling these samples from each month. And then if they have a positive sample. They go pull from that same source that they had the positive sample. They pull one upstream, one downstream, and then a repeat from that same source. And then they go back to whatever water sources are providing that tap, whether it's a well or a spring or a group of wells or springs. And they pull a sample from that to see if that – and most of the time those come back clean because it's usually – like I said, coliform is an extremely weak weak bacteria. It's easy to kill. And most of the time, those are flukes. The real dangerous ones, and we actually call the state immediately, is if we get, not only is it coliform positive, but if it's E. coli positive, now we've got a real problem. Hopefully, those, like, those are the things that will lead to the state issuing a boil order if we're getting E. coli positives that are showing up repeatedly. That's where they, they can run into problems like that. Okay, so coliform's an initial indicator, pretty weak. E. coli shows up, and I know we've had E. coli outbreaks before. That can be dangerous as far as health issues or even deadly in some cases for some people, depending on the illness it causes. So if those are found, that's where that sets off alarms. And once in a great while, maybe every year or two in our district, we'll have a boil order, seems like, for a small part of a city or water system, right, where the, that population is alerted effective immediately, boil all your drinking water or drink bottled water until we let you know otherwise, till we can figure out what's going on. A lot of times those are issued in a precautionary stage, not to say absolutely that they're always precautionary, but sometimes it's, Hey, our spring ran dry and a bunch of dirt flowed into the the system and we don't know how long it's going to take us to get clean. They'll issue, sometimes the water system itself will issue a boil order without waiting for the state or the health officer to do it. Okay. But and so those will, a lot of times, the last couple I know of that made the news weren't even issued by the state or the health officer. They were just issued by the water system itself. And were those precautionary? I believe they were. Okay. I, we're not directly involved in that too much at the environmental health level. Okay. So we, it sounds like we kind of take for granted the background quiet work that goes into whether it's us or a state agency continually monitoring, kind of auditing our water system, testing it so that, you know, we, we rarely have outbreaks that are water caused, whereas, like you said, 100 years ago, very common to have, you know, huge outbreaks of cholera or uh, dysentery, those type of things you can get from contaminated drinking water. So uh, it's one of those things we never think about that, 
one of the reasons we're so healthy is because our drinking water is clean and it's because of the work that goes into it behind the scenes. Yeah, absolutely. Every water system, even the smallest water systems that are public, are required to have a certified operator that's gone through a certain level of training depending, again, on the population that they're serving and how big their water system is. They have to get a certain amount of training and then they take a test to prove to the EPA that they know their stuff well enough to keep that water protected. And that really helps immensely to have that on-site person who's got some level of training. It's the same thing with our, um, just to shift back a little bit to our swimming pools, we require our swimming pools to have a qualified operator. There's several different agencies that uh, provide that level of training, uh, which is why we say qualified operator. Some people will think certified operator, certified pool operator is actually a trademarked term. Right. So as a government entity, we have to be careful about using that. We say qualified pool operator. So what's considered a public pool, what by your earlier definition, four or more families that use it or in a hotel or a country club or whatever, uh, there's a staff or an owner, someone needs to get qualified. Is that an online training? Uh, it is not available online. If if someone's interested in finding out more, I'm putting in a pool that's going to be public or I'm putting in a septic tank or I, I've got to have forms for my water system. Uh, can you access some of those from our website? There are some checklists on the website. You'd go to swuhealth.org and then under services, you'd go to environmental health. And then there are various sections of environmental health. There's a water lab one that has our lab forms. There's one for septic systems. It might be listed as on-site wastewater, which is the academic way of saying septic system. Right. And then there is a checklist for swimming pools as well. Okay. So that's swuhealth.org. Under services, you look for envir- environmental health and you can explore that. I think there's also some phone numbers there that if you need to call and talk to a live one of you guys, environmental health scientists, you can consult and counsel people on here's the process. Kind of overlook that sometimes between here and the Cedar City office of our environmental health staff can, can kind of tutor and assist people through the process so they know what to do next if they're dealing with safe water. We have to be careful with that because we are the regulating agency. Mm-hmm. So we, we can't act as a consultant on how to design or develop something. Okay. But we can, you know, we are, we do want to be a resource. We're not here to say, well, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. We're public servants. We want to help you get it right rather than don't come to us with your septic system and say, here, draw this for me. We're not going (laughs) to do that. But they can say, check this for me. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They can say, I, I answer questions all the time. You know, how many bedrooms do you think this house is? How many square feet of leach field do you think I need? I'm not going to. I'm not going to draw it for you. I'm not going to design what that layout should be because I'm going to be going out and checking that, or one of my coworkers is going to be going out. Okay. Well, thank you. That's been Clint Fry, and we'll see you next Thursday at three o'clock for the Southwest Utah Public Health Health Update.